Gagan, you would like to say something about the World Health Day today? Yeah, today is the World Health Day. And the only thing that I can think of for today, the only message that I think is important is that the world should remain as healthy as possible. This corona thing has to go away. It has to just disappear. Uh, we just can hope, hope, hope. And, and, and I'm sure that our hope will be fulfilled that this huge pandemic will just go away very soon and the world would be as healthy as ever. Uh, that's the only thing I can hope at and, and wish as of today. So good morning, Matilda. Good Welcome morning. to you. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, everybody. Hello. Good morning. So is Frank around or Frank is... Yes, uh, yeah. Frank is here. He just finished his work in the world. Hi. And he is here with us. We have the distance, sort of security distance between us, but he is here. Hello. Hi, Frank. Good morning. Hi, how are you? Nice to meet you. Uh, thank you. I know you are in a difficult situation and there are a lot of uh, dead people around you, and but you have been brave and working hard and you could take out time for your Indian friends. So we are very thankful to you. And I tell I, uh, my two chairperson, Dr. Pramod Paul, he is the mm -hmm. President Indian Academy of Neurology. And the other is Dr. Dagandeep Singh. I think your video is off. So can somebody on the video, Dagan? Could you just uh, give us uh, two minutes? We need to open the, the, uh, the slides here. There's a, yes. there's a problem. We open yes. the slides in one minute, OK? Sure, sure. Mute stop video. Okay. Bhavesh, can you uh, put the Gagandeep's uh, video on? No. Uh, sir, I'm, I'm just trying that. Uh, I have also informed Dr. Singh he's not there because his uh, microphone is also mute. Okay. Okay. Uh, my microphone is all right, but I'm just trying to figure out Monitoring. No, getting no, no. Uh, started. Oh, okay. Okay, Nirmal. So, first of all, welcome <laughs> and thank you for inviting us to join you from uh, Italy. And it is a pleasure to, to be together with you. Uh, together with uh, Frank, we have our presentation now. We hope we are able to share them. Um, the only is that I have to understand how to do it because you have to help me with that. So There is a share screen. You open your presentation on your laptop. And then okay. on the down, there is a green share screen. If you click on that, then you will see your desktop and then you click on your presentation. Okay, I will. I'm using a Windows machine or a Mac machine? Uh, Which is your laptop? Apple laptop or... Uh, uh, Windows, Windows laptop, share, share over here. Okay, Windows, Windows laptop. I think we're starting now. Okay, okay, all right. Start screen share while the other participating sharing. So oh, somebody else you, is sharing. Is, so is yes, somebody else you, sharing? Can you try again? Okay. Okay. So that's it. Yes, now we can see your screen. Can you see that? Can Oops. you see this? Yes, 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 we can. Yes. yes. But Frank is not visible, so yes, I'm, I'm here. Here. Yeah. yeah, we can see you. Okay. Let me just oh. move the. Uh, just a minute, uh, Dr. Pramod Paul will like to introduce uh, Frank to you. Good, uh, good morning, uh, my Italian colleagues, and good afternoon for the Indian colleagues. So this is the uh, one of the webinars uh, initiated by the Indian Federation of Neuro Rehab and Neuro Rehab Subsection of Neurology. And uh, this is a very important uh, day also today because it is World Health Day, which was uh, initiated almost 72 years back, way back in 1948. And it is irony that we are going to assemble today to discuss one of the most important uh, threat to, uh, for us, uh, the COVID-19 infection. And I'm sure that this webinar with our two esteemed uh, speakers, uh, all of us will be enlightened with what is the actual scenario and the Italian experience. 
So I welcome for the first talk, I welcome Dr. Frank Rassulo, who is the president of the Italian Society of Neuroanesthesiology for the uh, first talk. Uh, he, Dr. Frank is associate professor in anesthesiology and intensive care. He is also the director of the residency program and specialization school in anesthesiology and intensive care for the University of Vesia. And he's the chair of the Neuroanesthesia and Neurointensive Care Study Group for the Italian National Society of Anesthesiology Intensive Care. So I welcome uh, Dr. Fang and uh, to give you to give the first lecture on general perspective of COVID, the Italian experience. Dr. Fang, please. Yes, uh, thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure uh, to uh, to be here and uh, to be able to present this, uh, this uh, preliminary data regarding what the situation here in Italy is. I hope you can hear me because I, I can barely hear you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes we are able to hear you. Okay, so uh, I'd like to start from this uh, interesting uh, paper which was published in, uh, uh, in JAMA on March 13th by the group in Milano. And uh, it just sums up what the first uh, reaction was uh, regarding the uh, Italian situation. On February 20th, uh, the first patient was a 30-year-old patient was admitted to the hospital. And I think everybody knows uh, this patient was uh, um, uh, from Codogno. And for Italy, this was the uh, patient uh, zero. And uh, af after he was diagnosed with having SARS-CoV-2 disease, uh, during the next uh, 24 hours, the number of patients uh, increased from one to 36. So it was obvious that there was a, uh, a, a very important situation, a grave situation uh, that was developing. So what the first thing that was done was that the day after uh, the government created a, uh, a local uh, and the local health authorities created a, a task force emergency for, in order to uh, affront this uh, emergency. So uh, basically uh, what we were starting from was the uh, total capacity of ICU beds of 720. And that's roughly 2.9% of the total hospital beds among 74 hospitals in the uh, Lombardy uh, area. And the uh, first thing to, uh, the first decision, decision that was made was to uh, try to uh, bring out to uh, sort out what the first 15 uh, most uh, important and, and the largest hospitals uh, were in the Lombardy area, which could act as first responders, hub hospitals. So uh, the first uh, things that were, that were performed were to create, and this is very important, create cohorts of ICUs for COVID-19 uh, COVID patients. And uh, this is, and we needed to separate the COVID, the, uh, COVID patients from the non-COVID patients in order to minimize a risk of in-hospital transmission. The second thing was to organize a uh, triage uh, where the patients could receive uh, mechanical ventilation if necessary in every hospital in order to support the clinically ill patients. And the third uh, thing we, that was performed was to uh, test them rapidly in order to allocate them to the appropriate uh, uh, cohort. And uh, obviously we needed to ensure uh, DPIs and correct and uh, uh, protective uh, measurements. And that was uh, quite difficult, but uh, uh, we were able to do so uh, since that we already had material uh, ready uh, from the previous uh, SARS uh, epidemic. And uh, then uh, subsequently uh, we also tried to reduce quite rapidly the amount of uh, 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 elective uh, surgery that was performed in those days. So we abruptly and quickly stopped all elective uh, uh, surgery in order to have the personnel on hand. And within 48 hours, uh, 130 COVID ICU beds were made. And uh, by uh, March 7, the total number of ICU beds went up to 482. So as you can see from the slope, that was a quite rapid increase in uh, ICU uh, beds. And uh, the, the, day, the following day, 
we had started um, transferring patients outside the region. And these were patients who were also the negative, COVID negative patients were starting to be separated by also transferring the patients outside the Lombardy uh, region in order to separate them correctly from the COVID patients. Okay, and these are, this is the data regarding what the situation is in Italy, what it was in Italy yesterday, just to give you a brief run up. Uh, there were uh, 93,000 uh, active cases. The death toll uh, is now roughly 16,500, and that's plus six, uh, 636 compared to the uh, um, previous day. And the total number of uh, COVID positive patients uh, is now 133,000 uh, or 133,000 cases. Total number of patients who have been cured, who have recovered, is uh, 20, roughly 23,000. That's plus one. So even though things may seem to have slowed down a bit, it still represents an important situation. So what we're trying to do now is convince people that the problem is definitely not over and to please uh, stay home and, and continue with the uh, appropriate measures, which is quite difficult to do because now it's, it's spring season, so people are already starting to go out. And as you can see, I don't know if you can see it because I can't see it here, but the, uh, the slope, as you can see, the first, uh, the, the gray, slope is represents what the number of uh, COVID positive patients are in Milano. Right after that, you would have Bergamo and then Brescia is right up there. So these three areas are the most interested and the slope is still going, is still quite steep. This is interesting in the sense that uh, it represents what the first measures were. Uh, on day, on the 4th of March, uh, following the uh, outbreak, the, we, the, 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 there was a total closure of all the schools and the uh, university. On uh, March 9th, we, there was a total restriction, a curfew in the uh, Lombardy area. And on uh, March 11th, the, all these restrictions were extended to the rest of Italy and closed and um, all the activities, daily activities were also closed. So what is important is what will condition what will happen from when everything is closed from when you start the measures to what the outcome will be uh, of the outbreak uh, depends on these first uh, two weeks so that was very important and this is this is also important for uh, other yeah. countries to start these measures as soon as possible the total number now the total number of icpu beds occupied uh, are in Lombardy 1,300 and uh, most 1,300. So that's basically double to what the uh, capacity of the ICU beds uh, were previously. And these are all COVID-19 ICU beds. As you can see the, uh, on the left of the screen, the, the number of uh, ICU beds being occupied per day, the slope has kind of gradually uh, become flat so we're actually reducing the number of ICU beds occupied by COVID-19 patients. Uh, and we also flatten the patients admitted to the uh, hospital. And that goes along with an increase of people being isolated uh, at home. Uh, on the right of the screen, you would have the mortality rate uh, based on the age group. It's obvious that the older you are, the higher the mortality will be. So the highest mortality was between the uh, um, sorry, I can't see right now, I guess it's about 80, between 80 and 90 uh, years old and above 90, obviously. What's unfortunately interesting to see is that even between 30 and 39 years old, the death rate was 0.4%. Uh, and most of these patients were either obese or did have a concomitant comorbidity. However, there were patients who had no previous uh, medical history. This uh, paper came, uh, was published yesterday. It's very interesting. It's uh, directed by the Milano Group, but it also includes all of the uh, centers in a uh, large part of, uh, most, of the, most of Italy, including uh, Brescia. And what you can see here, these are patients who were admitted, into the, uh, IC, admitted to ICU. And regarding the age group, most of the patients admitted were between 62 and 66 years of age. 
And uh, the in, in these patients, what's interesting to note is that the F, uh, the ratio uh, at presentation of these patients was between 75, these are ICU patients, 75 and 125 uh, PO2, FiO2 uh, ratio. And the FiO2 at which these patients were maintained was mostly from 50 to 60. And the PEEP also, median PEEP was roughly between 14 and uh, 16. The uh, interesting to know regarding this, pa this paper was that these are, this is a paper published regarding 1,600 uh, patients. Uh, it's a retro retrospective study on these patients infected with, with uh, COVID-19 disease in the uh, um, Lombardy region of Italy. And uh, what's, uh, as I was saying, what's interesting is that the um, number of patients ventilated, uh, mechanically ventilated, was higher than the previously published papers from China or other, other countries. 88% of our patients were mechanically uh, ventilated. And um, on the other hand, the non-invasive uh, ventilation was lower than the previous reported uh, reports. 11% of these patients uh, were, uh, were treated non-invasively. Um, as I said, this, these are the 1,600 patients within the admitted to the ICUs in the Lombardy uh, region. And the age group here also uh, was uh, quite high. The most, most of the patients included were male, um, and there were male patients who uh, were above uh, uh, 60 years of age. And 27% uh, of the patients who uh, had, did have, uh, mm, were prone in this uh, age group. So that's quite interesting. And uh, the mortality rate, overall mortality rate, as of March uh, 25th, uh, was, uh, is 26%. However, we still have 58% uh, at this at this stage. 58% of the patients in the ICU, in the ICU were still were still present. So, uh, in order to have the correct mortality rate, we would have to see what happens to the rest of the patients in, uh, who are who are presently in the ICU at that period of time. Now, the, we're getting here's the Brescia situation. In Brescia, the first COVID patient uh, was isolated on the 23rd of February, and since then until April 2nd. Uh, 2,600 COVID patients were brought uh, uh, diagnostic, uh, diagnosed as COVID positive and presented within our institute, which is composed of uh, three hospitals in Brescia, Spital Civili of Brescia, Montichiari, and uh, Gardone Valtrompia. Of the patients admitted on April 2nd, 580 were discharged home and 2,002 patients were admitted. And of these 2,002 admitted patients, 552 were discharged as clinically cured. There were 403 deaths, 238 patients were transferred elsewhere, and 800, because of the lack of ICU bed and resources, and 809 patients are still admitted within our institute. Interesting to see on the green slope, you have the number of COVID patients. So the red slope, you have the number, uh, I'm sorry, COVID beds. And the red slope, you have the number of non-COVID beds. Uh, they intersect on uh, March 11th. And then obviously the number of COVID beds uh, uh, rapidly substitutes and increases far above the number of non-COVID beds. And here on the bottom right of the screen, also you can see that the number of non-ICU uh, uh, admissions had gradually reduced, non-COVID, sorry, uh, admissions had reduced and, and it has been substituted by the uh, COVID admissions to the uh, ICU. Also, the number of patients uh, non-invasively ventilated obviously has, has increased quite rapidly. Now, I decided to keep this slide because it was quite interesting. This is a meeting that we recently had in, uh, in, our, in our hospital where these, uh, this data was shown. We have, uh, we started from 34 ICU beds within two main uh, general intensive care units. And we also have a pediatric intensive care unit and a, a cardio, uh, cardiac and, uh, anesthetic intensive care unit. And we rapidly, uh, increase these uh, ICU beds within two weeks from 34 
to uh, plus, uh, we, we doubled the amount of ICU beds and I can't see it on the right of the screen. Just one second. You could bring this down here. Just a clock. Yeah. Well, that's okay. Uh, I'll, I think I should remember where that. As you can see on the right of the screen, uh, we started from uh, the, we transformed the first ICU, the um, COVID, we call it COVID-1 into a, uh, a cohort of uh, COVID uh, patients, 20, 20 beds. The second was performed on the 2nd of uh, March. Uh, that's another COVID center. That was the uh, cardiac intensive care unit, uh, bringing out another 14 beds. And COVID-3 on the 9th of, uh, uh, of March. And that was, uh, that was a old, old, it was a closed, a cardiac uh, uh, theater uh, operating room, and it had quickly been uh, restructured it, mm, purposely to uh, bring out to create a new ICU beds. So we uh, taken out 13 from that unit. Uh, we've also uh, transformed the pediatric intensive care unit into a maternal uh, intensive care unit because we had uh, patients who had either just given birth or uh, the pregnant uh, women who developed the disease and we decided to keep those patients there and treat them within this intensive care unit and there are three beds uh, and also we the last uh, unit that was uh, created was also uh, restructured from a closed area uh, of the uh, section of the hospital we created a sub intensive care unit uh, in order to create a either a step down uh, unit or when or just a case of a further overflow of uh, and the necessity to have more ICU beds. And uh, interesting to note is that this uh, subintensive care unit is run by um, uh, uh, personnel both from our hospital and also from a Polish team who has come to uh, help us. Also people from uh, Albania uh, have also come to uh, give us some help, but the uh, people, Polish team was running this subintensive care unit with us and uh, it's doing quite well actually. Okay, a brief run up regarding the pathophysiology. If there's anything that um, is redundant, please stop me. Um, is that okay? If if anything is redundant or if I'm repeating something that uh, you don't want to hear, you just stop me, okay? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Okay. Hey. So, uh, very important, we know that this is a two-phase disease. You have the viral, res viral response and then you would have a, a host inflammatory response. And uh, uh, very quickly, uh, it, the uh, viral response is, is the, um, the area, the initial phase where you would perform your usual therapies, the antiviral therapy, and, the, the, uh, and we're losing a, a lot of uh, hydroxychloroquine in this beginning, uh, beginning of this phase. And you may have a, uh, still a normal uh, CT scan or chest X-ray in this phase. It could also be uh, non-normal. In the second phase, you would have the actual uh, inflammatory, host inflammatory phase. And this is the typical phase where you would start developing the uh, uh, ARDS uh, symptoms and uh, pathophysiology. And this is the phase where you would use all the, your notions regarding the mechanical ventilation, either protective and non-protective mechanical ventilation, prone positioning, nitric oxide, and uh, even uh, ECMO. The, 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 let's say that the difficulty, the challenge is knowing what to do in these, this gray area, let's call it this middle phase, where you have an intersection between the viral phase and the, uh, the, the host inflammatory phase. And this is where some of uh, these, uh, uh, let's call them new uh, drugs have been used. First of all, I know it's debatable, but we did use and we do use dexamethasone in, uh, in this phase. And uh, it's obvious that we have to be sure that the viral response has uh, uh, been concluded Uh, it, and uh, we try to catch the uh, initial uh, phase of the inflammatory response. So the more you, you catch that initial uh, 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 phase, uh, in probably the better the uh, response of the patient will be towards this type of therapy. For example, the cortisone, we've seen that uh, if we start the cortisone, we use desimethasone 20 milligrams a day per uh, five days. And then depending on the response, we will either continue it for uh, another five days at 10 milligrams per day, 
or if we see that the patient does not respond or if the patient is intubated, we've decided to stop that therapy. So as a personal note, what I've seen is that uh, if your patient reacts to dexamethasone, the patient reacts quickly. If the patient does not respond, I would not continue it for a long period of time because you, then you would start seeing the side effects. We do use new uh, humanized monoclonal antibodies, uh, either the ones, the um, uh, IL-6 uh, uh, um, receptors, blockers and antibodies, uh, for example, tocilizumab or uh, others which act uh, a bit before the uh, IL-6, which is the IL-1B, the kind of kinubab. We're starting to start to use this later we have been using tocilizumab and results seem to be, this is our personal view of it. We're looking at the data now. So until we have any conclusive uh, data, I could give you what our personal view is. And we see that also here, if the patient uh, responds to this therapy, the patient responds quite quickly. And we also have to catch it in this initial, initial phase. Excuse me, let me just turn this off. Okay, uh, so what regarding the therapy, and now I, I don't have time to get into this, but, uh, and this is also in Italian, but what we usually do, I'll give you the English version. What we usually do is uh, we would start or maintain the antiviral therapy in these patients uh, uh, with the usual antivirals that you uh, already know. And a, um, there's been a lot of debate, sorry, there's been a lot of debate regarding the, the, um, the use of the antiviral therapy in the New England uh, paper published that there was kind of a not so grand response to the initial antiviral therapy. However, uh, the therapy was used within the whole time frame, within both phases of the pathology. So even here, if you're going to use it, it's important that you, that you use it in the initial phase. Otherwise, Otherwise, you'll find the results that they found in the, in the uh, New England uh, paper. And uh, we would use the Lopinovar or uh, Ritonavir uh, uh, together with either chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, or we would use the Remdesivir, uh, either one or the uh, other. And if the patient would uh, later develop uh, ARDS, then again, we're already in the second phase and here we would start all our, sorry, our uh, other types of, uh, of uh, therapeutic strategies, which could be either intubation and from then on, uh, as I will show you in the, in the next slides, uh, decide whether to prone the patient or use nitric oxide or other, or even ECMO and other measures. I'd like to uh, show you uh, this very nice program that was created here in Brescia. You can find it on MedCalc, and it it's, uh, was produced here in Brescia. And again, I don't have time to go through the whole uh, program, but what it actually does, it brings you through both the initial phase of the disease and can help you decide whether to proceed towards non-invasive ventilation or invasive ventilation. And also on the right of the screen, it, you can also have the, uh, the uh, therapies, the standard therapies, which will be associated with each phase. And also it would bring you through the, uh, uh, the step back process, which would be uh, meaning the weaning process. It's very interesting. And uh, we've recently, um, uh, publish this uh, through uh, MedCalc and hopefully we're publishing it in, in a paper, which will come out soon. But if you look at this website, sorry, I'll show you to you again, the website, you could download it on MedCalc, or if you go to MedCalc, it's just digit Brescia COVID-19 respiratory severity scale. Okay, uh, we've had problems uh, just finishing up with the therapy with uh, pulmonary embolism and with uh, problems with the coagulation, mostly hypercoagulability. And we've seen quite a number as many centers of patients with uh, pulmonary emboli. It's obvious that ever, ever since we've seen the first uh, few cases, we started to check it a lot more oftenly. So the more you check, the more you'll find, uh, but there is a high incidence of pulmonary emboli. And a lot of these um, patients are also clinically uh, uh, the, the, the presentation is also clinically significant. 
not uh, mostly starting with uh, hypoxia, which continues for a long period of time despite uh, various measures, and then followed by even significant hemodynamic uh, responses. Now here, there are a lot of, sorry, uh, there's a lot of debate on how to diagnose this properly through uh, the edema um, or whatnot. But uh, as you know, if the edema is high, you're not sure if it is pulmonary embolism or not. If it's low, then you could probably outrule any presence of uh, uh, pulmonary embolism. But what the suggestion is, is to use uh, the CT scan for this uh, purpose mostly, and also combine it with, obvious, obviously combine it with uh, echo, uh, frequent echocardiograms. And uh, it may be worthwhile um, thinking about a certain type of uh, prophylaxis with either low molecular weight uh, heparin. Uh, we, based on the patient's weight, we, we're not using a therapeutic dose yet. We're thinking about it, uh, but we're using, for example, celeparin uh, for a 70 kilogram patient uh, instead of 0.6 per day, maybe 0.4, two times a day or whatnot. Uh, this is very interesting. This is a this is also published by um, our colleagues in Brescia, Borghese and Maroldi, Professor Maroldi. It uh, it makes things a lot simpler to pass on information between various colleagues. Instead of saying that the patient has this amount of interstitial alveolar infiltrations, how much, how little, we just uh, we just include this in the score. If you uh, if you uh, individualize six areas. Uh, three per uh, per lung, uh, where you could uh, score have a score from one to three. You could actually uh, score the amount of uh, um, areas interested in, in 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 with the disease in these patients. For example, on the top, the patient would have a score total score of three, so the patient would would still be uh, um, have a a low grade, let's say, our um, uh, uh, chest X ray. Uh, regarding the COVID the disease. If the patient has, like on the bottom, a score of, say, four, six, 11, then the patient has passed, obviously, as you can see, I know you might not need a score to decide this, but you, as you can see, the patient has increased. If you don't see the chest X-ray, then it's difficult to describe how, uh, how much the person has worsened. But if you give, uh, we've, we've seen that if you give the, uh, the colleague the score, uh, then it's much easier to convey this information. And obviously you can see that here a patient passed from a 12 through a uh, the maximum score, which is 18. Okay, I'll be finishing with this note. This is a very interesting uh, letter by uh, notes by Professor Gattinoni, who I, I imagine you all know. He divides uh, the COVID-19 ICU patients into two main categories. And this is very important because we also noticed this at the beginning that the patients uh, initially did not were not presenting themselves at the typical as a typical ARDS patients. They had a very good compliance, and they did not have initially uh, difficulty expanding their chest. They did not have staccato speech, but if you looked at their uh, blood gas analysis, they would be quite hypoxic. And uh, therefore, this would be the category of the high pulmonary compliance patients with isolated viral pneumonia. Here, the uh, patient, the main finding would be due to the uh, hypoxic vasoconstriction, and uh, which could explain, as he points out, the uh, severe hypoxia. And here, the patient could also have high PEEP. You could also increase the uh, volume, uh, uh, the uh, tidal volume in these patients, and in, also in the uh, minute volume could actually be increased. You could, uh, instead of the usual protect lung protective ventilation, you could actually ventilate this patient with, with more than six mLs. Um, so, mm, and also regarding the, uh, the uh, frequency, instead of uh, having a high frequency for protective lung ventilation, you could also uh, keep that frequency uh, below uh, 20, for example. And then you have the other category of patients who uh, have been treated with uh, CPAP, either with helmet. We use a lot of helmets in Italy or CPAP or BPAP uh, face masks. And usually these patients are kept on these, on these uh, devices for a long period of time. And they start to develop uh, a volatrauma or self-induced uh, ventilator-induced lung injury. And when these patients would need uh, in the long run uh, intubation and uh, mechanical ventilation, 
they present themselves with a, a lot of great difficulties and complications. These are the patients that usually have to be treated with nitric oxide, high PEEP, uh, proning, positioning, and some, sometimes even ECMO. And usually these are younger patients, as we're seeing now, because they resist a lot more than the older patients and they stay home a lot longer. And when they do get uh, worse, they come in and they present themselves in a grave situation. Uh, that's it. Okay, so that's it. I'm finishing. I won't get into the other types of. Uh, maybe if you want to ask questions later. I thank you very much for your for your attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Vestulo, for the wonderful talk and very informative lecture on the epidemiology diagnosis and the management, especially the uh, strategy for mobilizing the beds. Now, I think we'll take the questions uh, after the second talk, and I hand over. To Dr. Gagandeep, to uh, deal with the further. Uh, thank you, Pramod, and thank you. What a wonderful lecture, actually. I mean, I, it's actually an eye opener. Uh, the next talk is by Professor Matilde Leonardi. She's from Vesta, the Institute of Neurology, Vesta. She's a neurologist, a pediatrician, and a neuro rehab specialist. So, so it's all in one, combined in one, and and she's from the, the her institute is is a WHO collaborating center in new, uh, neuro rehab. So uh, she is actually going to tell us about her experience, specifically about rehab of COVID nineteen patients, neuro rehabilitation. How do we go about it? I think that this, she's probably going to talk a lot about tele rehabilitation and and uh, how how do we continue with rehab in the during the pandemic uh, dr matilda leonardi thank you so much and good morning for us this morning good afternoon everybody and uh, i really thank you my colleague and friend nirmal for inviting me to do this presentation i will mostly speak about the neurological complications because then of course the cascade of rehabilitation that we can plan has also uh, links with what we see. Well, you already heard from Frank the spread of COVID. And I think that uh, what I want to underline is that maybe also in your country, you're facing the, incredul no, the incredulity and uh, the resistance of population to believe that this is really something really important. And what I also want to highlight is that you have seen that at the beginning, the disease was presenting mostly as a uh, lung disease. I mean, the strong component that was engaging our colleagues from the uh, ICU, from the emergency, from the pneumology department was uh, the most relevant thing in terms of which kind of wave should we expect. However, the uh, increasing of the numbers was also showing us that there are different peaks in different areas and the kind of wave of symptoms are also very different according to the different phases. Um, we had five weeks of increasing knowledge. I think that what you've heard today from Frank would have not been the same five weeks ago. In five weeks, the amount of knowledge that has been acquired not only by Italy and by Brescia, which is the uh, place with the highest number of patients in, uh, in Italy, but I think that there has been an increase of knowledge and certainly in these five weeks, the role of neurologists and rehabilitation professional has come up as really, really important. It was not shown so important with the previous cases from China in which in fact, the uh, appearance of neurological symptoms were not so well described as it is happening uh, after the 26th of February when the first publication on the neurological complication from China came out. The data, in any case, from China and Italy clearly show that there is a nervous system involvement. I mean, this is also something that we have to keep in mind because also some of the patients go straight to the neurological department and then you discovered that the symptoms that they have are related to COVID. So I really warn you that not all the patients come to the hospital with respiratory symptoms. And I think this is really important to know because uh, the neurological symptoms might also worsen 
the clinical picture and the respiratory out outcomes. But it is well known that it is part of the virus, the beta coronavirus can be neuroinvasive. It, is, it was known already from previous epidemics and it was from the previous SARS and the Middle East uh, respiratory syndrome that are due to coronavirus and they cause acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, vasculopathy, and Guillain-Barre, and also some post-infectious brainstem. I, I, I want you to please note post-infectious because some months after the recovery of the patient, patients that were affected by SARS-CoV-1 and uh, MERS develop encephalitis. So we keep it this in mind, we still don't have uh, uh, after discharge encephalitis, but with the previous coronavirus one, we had cases of post-infectious uh, brainstem encephalitis. So several neurological disorders without uh, respiratory symptoms were uh, associated with uh, uh, seropositive for coronavirus. So this was something that we knew from the previous coronavirus. And so what we know is that uh, the coronavirus of uh, COVID-19 is sharing similar genetic traits, both with MERS and SARS, and also there are some common host cells. So the idea is that we are going to study in the next weeks the neurotropism through an invasion that is possible through the olfactory uh, nerve and the thalamus and the brainstem. And this can also have an effect on the cardiorespiratory drive. The first cases that were sort of resembling this kind of uh, cardio, central cardiorespiratory drive or a bulbar in, in, uh, involvement were at the beginning of March. At the end of February, the uh, Chinese were starting to publish, and these were the first three papers that were reporting about uh, the neuroinvasive potentials or COVID-2. And uh, that was associated to sudden death after discharge. We were see and so when uh, the embolic uh, pattern uh, was uh, discovered, and I would say that all the embolic pattern and the need for uh, thromboembolism uh, came in, uh, it was uh, like the 7th and 8th of March. But in the days before, we were having some reports from China of cases that were discharged from the hospital and they were having an acute and sudden death with no other symptoms. So the hypothesis of a central, of a bulbar in, uh, involvement so that the patient has a sudden death due to the stop of the respiratory was coming out. And uh, some of the reports started in the 10th of March, not before. But these, with these three first papers on the China epidemics were showing, clearly showing in uh, system, nervous system involvement. The Chinese divided the symptoms in three major involvement, central, peripheral, and musculo, neuromusculoskeletal involvement. The central symptoms were uh, described as headache, dizziness, and impaired consciousness, although there is no case report about this impaired consciousness as such, acute cerebrovascular disease that could be an increase of stroke, ischemic or hemorrhagic, but it is not clear, and we will have to look at the epidemiology of last year, if this increase in stroke is because you have coronavirus while you have a stroke or because you have a stroke because of coronavirus. This is still debatable and not even the studies that are performed now are able to clarify this, but the increase in the theory of uh, embolic uh, components of the disease are bringing us to think that there is also a, a stroke due to COVID, but we are exploring this field. The peripheral, the peripheral is uh, the Chinese were are reporting hyposmia and hypogeusia. I would say that I just discovered yesterday the name that has been given to this uh, hyposmia uh, that Italy refined because compared to the Chinese, what we are seeing here, um, sorry, I'm going again with the Chinese, uh, the Chinese also had some single case report of altered mental status. Okay, myalgia, please note this. The Chinese in the Wuhan study reported only 10% and rhabdomyolysis, it was one case description. So the idea is that we have a different perspective from Brescia, 
where the first neuro COVID unit of Italy has been opened. And it has been opened because many patients were entering the hospital during the uh, peak days only with neurological symptoms. So they were entering for neuro strange neurological symptoms. We know other uh, previous reported neurological disease. And their first sign was a neurological sign. So they were recovered into the neurological world. And only after they were discovering that they were positive to the tampon for coronavirus. And uh, what the Italians did, different from the Chinese, is certainly what we are discovering is that many, many Italians are having uh, not only hyposmia, but anosmia. And uh, the peripheral theory is okay, so there must be an involvement of the peripheral nerve, and usually hypogesia is also associated with anosmia, we know. Yesterday, a group of uh, uh, Israeli colleagues has been called this coronosmia. So they are naming this anosmia, do coronavirus, as coronosmia. So I see this neologism that is still not in ICD-10, but uh, this is how they are going to study it. And um, there are theories that in some cases, anosmia can precede of one or two days. So the lack of all the smells is preceding of one or two days the, um, the other symptoms. So there is now a test that we are sort of, uh, we are in a trial now to see whether using some home uh, perfumes, there are five perfumes that we ask patients to grade while they're still at home. If we can detect through an algorithm, if there is a connection between the level of anosmia and the appearance or the increase of uh, the uh, symptoms that are going to come. So this is the study. This anosmia is temporary. It usually stays for 10 to 15 days, but sometimes it can be a bit longer and there is a slow recovery from it. What we also reported from Italy, which was not reported, and these are still things that are going to be published by our own publication, is that some patients have dysartrium, many patients have acroparesthesias, so in the peripheral, and it is, can be related to the issue that coronavirus has a strong vascular uh, component, so that you have the hands, the extreme limb, the hands and the uh, finger that are involved. Some uh, patients, and this is not described in the Chinese, but is now starting to be very much described in the Europeans, uh, French particularly, we have a lot of uh, uh, dermatological issues. It looks like you have uh, urticaria, like an acute uh, uh, allergy, uh, skin allergy, uh, but then it disappears. Um, there are also some cases in which we have been detecting the um, appearance like when you have a virus with the water inside, but that water doesn't have the virus inside. It's like varicella, but there's no virus inside. We tested the content of that. Um, other appearance of the virus in the first aid were seizures. Seizures with no fever, nothing else, seizures. The EG was non-altered after the end of the seizure. Then we had uh, some cases in which delirium anticipating the respiratory syndrome was the only case. So, of course, they were sent to neurology because patients were entering into the uh, emergency room with delirium with no other symptoms, only delirium that started from zero. And this delirium then was evaluated and then fever appeared after two, three days and delirium disappeared and then the pulmonary symptoms appeared. The other thing is that uh, encephalitis, contrary to MERS and SARS-CoV-1, and contrary to some description of the Chinese, we had in the emergency room several cases with, as a first sign, an encephalitis, as if the virus was having a neural attack before attacking other elements. The presence of anosmia, dysgeusia, and dysartria might let us think that there is a vagal invasion through the vagal nerve that goes directly to the bulbar, to the central. This should warn us about the managing of some patients with my present with strange symptoms and then develop after this. I just want to focus on something that is coming out now that we are starting to discharge patients. It is well known that after some staying in the ICU, patients present what is called clinical, clinical illness myopathy. And this is delaying the process of discharge. And this is where rehabilitation comes in because many patients are okay in terms of the pulmonary uh, picture, 
but they still have uh, this uh, critical illness myopathy, which is affecting also the diaphragm and the intercost in interchest uh, muscular apparatus, which then is delaying the uh, taking out of ventilator, not because of the ventilation symptoms, but because of the muscular inability to sustain the ventilation of a damaged uh, lung that we have after the infection. So in several COVID patients following ICU, we really need to think that there is a need for an approach of uh, rehabilitation that is taking into consideration critical illness myopathy. This is what we mostly see out of the 500 discharge patients here in Brescia, not so much polyneuropathy and not so much a combination of clinical illness myopathy and polyneuromyopathy. However, however, all the patients, all the patients coming out from ICU, they have an important neuromuscular weakness that is starting to be presented in the intensive care settings. This is why mobilization of patients, although it is impossible, um, uh, shows the importance of rehabilitation from the earliest possible phases of taking care of patients. So rehabilitation people were feeling that this was a disease that is not affecting their work, while on the contrary, immediately after ICU, I will say rehabilitation is one of the most important branch of medicine that has to deeply intervene for the recovery of the patients and for the taking care of the patients. So early mobilization, early initiation physical therapy, 10 and we all know this to provide a better functional outcome for patients with confirmed chronic illness myopathy. So the rehabilitation has a major role, not in the acute phase, but in the post-acute phase of coronavirus infection. The Chinese published on the 11th of March the recommendation for respiratory rehabilitation. I would say all the focus of rehabilitation in the very first stage of publication of this knowledge was focusing on Re respiratory rehabilitation. However, this is a mistake. If we only focus on the respiratory rehabilitation, we're going to miss the other symptoms that need to take into consideration for a recovery of the patient. Although what the Chinese said is that they divided the critical entry of rehabilitation into five steps. The first is that for the severe critical patients, the early performance of pulmonary rehabilitation is not suggested. So they suggest not to do rehabilitation in the very, very acute phase when the patient is intubated or when the patient is with high fever and with uh, severe symptoms. However, when you have to, uh, in patients not in the ICU, not intubated, certainly pulmonary rehabilitation relieves the symptoms of dyspnea, helps anxiety and depression, and also can improve physical function and quality of life. For patients who are isolated, they can be isolated in the hospital or at home, pulmonary rehabilitation guidance through videos, and you were mentioning uh, the telehealth. Okay, not too complex because not so many patients, as you have seen, uh, the disease is affecting most of old people. And in Italy, old people are not so well uh, provided with smartphone or other Skype or other means. So if you have old isolated patients at home, it is very difficult to reach them through the uh, video connection or telehealth because this is simply not available and many old patients don't have internet. So that is also something that you should consider when you say big use of telerehabilitation. It depends on the environment. Many uh, areas around Brescia, they are mountain areas. You have isolated patients. They stay isolated, but they have no connection through internet or so. So telerehabilitation is not an option and we are studying other means because you need a personal face-to-face -face with the people rehabilitation. So this is really complex. And uh, the pulmonary process so is number one for rehabilitation. However, uh, also the Italians came in with the, the respiratory care and they provided further recommendation also in light of the increasing importance of embolic and the thrombolic symptomatology that was coming out from the beginning of March. The Chinese were not reporting it until the end of February. So I would say in these five weeks, we have been learning a lot and we are using all the knowledge as it was suggested using heparin. It came in only after the 7th of March, not before. Also, the Italian Society of New Rehabilitation uh, presented its guidelines for the want to share my focus, not on the technique of rehabilitation, but on preserving 
the rehabilitation unit and the rehabilitation workers because they were the most affected because of the close contact with the patients. And I would say this is number one preoccupation you need to have once you plan any kind of thing. Protect, protect those that have to protect. If you don't protect your health workers, if you don't protect your health professionals, they will be highly affected. Unfortunately, in my country, we had more than 90 doctors that died and more than 300 health professionals that are still affected and in intensive care unit. So they are the strong victims of, together with priests, I would say, because also priests are paying a high tribute there are many priests that are dying now because of the concentration of people in the churches. That also is another category that is really having a lot of dying. However, what the Italians say is that you have to think to your department. You have to think first to continue your rehabilitation activities in the world only, only if you protect your health staff. If you, do not, if you don't have protection for your health staff, you close it. You better close it because you're going to damage your patients and you're going to damage and put at risk the life of your workers. And these rehabilitation activity require close contact with patients. So you might have the opportunity of having aerosols and secretions that are very much close and this needs to be avoided at all costs. The WHO protocols, of course, indicate a minimum standard for protection of health workers. You should follow that. Your Ministry of Health has to send out immediate indication. And if not that, the Indian Society of Rehabilitation and Neurorehabilitation should send immediately out guidelines for the protection of the workers. And uh, in the different areas, you have to consider that you have third level hospitals, which is the very fancy and beautiful hospital of India, where I had the pleasure also to come and visit. But you also have the primary health care and the community-based rehabilitation people who might play their role, but they are at the highest risk. Low protection, low ability to connect with the measures to protect. So you have to think to your primary health care workers and to protect them. And uh, I just want to say that there has been a wrong approach to coronavirus because at the beginning, every special it was entering, thinking that they were seeing the coronavirus. And what it is coming out after seven weeks of work here in Italy, it's in fact, is not an organic disease, but it's a multi-organic disease with multi-specialty needs. And all of them have to enter together. You don't see pieces of the elephant. You need to see the full picture all together. And only seeing the full picture and this is also another uh, suggestion that we derive from the center of Brescia, where I'm seconded, is that uh, you heard Frank describing the changes in the uh, organization of the beds. I would say that the major change that happened here was that all kinds of specialty grouped together and the focus was patient. And all together, they were having daily meetings deciding what to do for the patients to change. As you've seen, there's not consolidated therapy yet. We're still studying it. And this requires a multi specialty view. We have, and um, we are following, all of us, we are following the WHO uh, coronavirus pandemic information. But I would say that if I can say just one word as we all work in rehabilitation, please also take into consideration that within this tragedy, there is a tragedy that is affecting twice people affected by previous chronic health condition and disability. Please follow the lines. It will be maybe subject for another webinar, but people with disability are suffering double, particularly people with intellectual disability. That's a major problem. It's very difficult to put them under ventilation and respiration. So the suggestion that we have from Italy, it was not coming from China. There's no report about this, is that you identify some areas of rehabilitation or some centers in which you confine people with disability to provide them some, not people with a physical disability, you can try to do something for them. And I will say there is a paper that I'm going to publish in a few days about the stigma that is going around the world against seniors and against people with disability. As you know, in many states, the legislation said that if you have a person with disability, they, those are the person that will not get any kind of ventilation. This is opens up a huge area of ethical consideration and access to care and equity of access to care uh, to health of many, many countries. So just closing this, I just want to present you the birth 
BIRTH is the British International Research and Training Hub that is coming out from the experience of the highest number of beds that we are recovering here in uh, Brescia. And uh, we are going to develop this. It's, an in, it's a hub for international collaboration. We will prepare the database and the registry of all the 2,500 patients, and we will be able to share training, information, epidemiological. We will connect with the big international thing, but we will also be ready to provide some help and support to others. It is from this Brescia Center that you might have heard about the uh, diving mask that have been transformed in uh, uh, CPAP respiratory with a sort of homemade transformation and the 3D technology that helps people to breathe. So just going to an end, I would say that nobody wins alone and only together we will beat coronavirus. And together, when I say together, I mean the whole world of science. If there is somebody that can defeat this virus is science and I believe in the power of science. And this is why we're here this morning to share what we know with the humility of human beings, but with the hope that science will help us to defeat this horrible, horrible, horrible virus. And I thank you so much from Milano and from Brescia is all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Leonardi. Thank you. We really like, liked your last slide. It's excellent. I mean, we have to be in it together. And, and we really liked your cartoon of the elephant. I think um, a multi-speciality approach, everyone needs to get in together. And that's the key message. We, we just really appreciate that. There are a lot of questions, about 23 questions. Um, can I ask uh, Professor Nirmal Surya to take over the questions? He can. Uh, Nirmal, is it OK with you? Yeah. Fine. Yeah. So yeah, there are a couple of uh, questions which overlap. Uh, Matilda, if you can uh, click on to unshare your slide, then you know everybody will be able to see you properly. So you can disconnect the sharing of the slides. Okay. That's perfect. So the one question is, uh, Frank, could you answer what is the reason of high mortality rate in Italy? The reason of the high mortality rate, there, there are a few explanations. First, first of all, we were the first ones after China to have been involved. And uh, despite that, uh, I think that our response was extremely rapid. And as you've seen in the first, it all depends on the first, the first week, how fast you're able to uh, start confinement and convince the population that it is serious and to stay home because uh, staying home might not seem like a preventive therapy, but it's the best thing that can be done initially. Uh, another reason is also that in Lombardy, as you can see, there's a quite, there's quite a difference between Lombardy and the rest of Italy, is that there is a high uh, elderly uh, population also in, in Italy in general. So the, elder, uh, the elderly were obviously um, hit first and they were hit hard. And then as we started convincing people to stay home, uh, we started to see the younger generation come in who actually resisted a lot longer. And uh, so this is the main, I think these are the main reasons why uh, the, um, th there's such a high death rate compared to other countries where they performed, uh, for example, Germany definitely has a lower uh, age population and also was performed a lot uh, of tests um, quite early. So that could also explain the uh, differences. Mm. I can't mute mute. Okay, is that uh, COVID nineteen host immunity taker longer than other coronavirus to develop? You think? Can you repeat that, please? Sorry. Uh, the immunity, the COVID nineteen host immunity, taking longer uh, than other coronavirus. The immunity. I, I can't hear that that word. The you, you, what? Host host immunity. Oh, host immunity. Oh, uh, host. Uh, Compared to other types of uh, SARS, sure. we'd actually, yeah. we don't actually know that now. That's what they were hoping on in England, I understand. But uh, uh, we are uh, hoping that will come along uh, soon. But I don't think we should depend on that. That should, that should not be the uh, main target for any country. It should be avoiding to have to resort to that. Perfect. There's one more related uh, uh, question from Ahmedabad. 
uh, is the strain of uh, covid 19 all over world is the same or it is uh, different in different countries il il tipo genetico di coronavirus è uguale dappertutto o è mutato Oh, that's that's a good question, but I I we don't we don't actually know that now. Uh there was some debate on whether uh since it started on the older population and then it went to the younger population if there was a mutation or not. But I don't I don't really think that that that's the main reason that this happened. So um, I I'm not maybe I I just don't have that information, but uh I don't I don't think that that has happened. And uh, are there any guidelines uh, being followed for the cardio respiratory Uh, management in ICU for COVID-19. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. There is a lot uh, in literature regarding the association between cardiomyopathy and cardio uh, um, megalopathy regarding and the coronavirus COVID-19 disease. Uh, however, we haven't performed. We don't have specific guidelines uh, other than what we would normally do when we're faced with a patient with cardiomyopathy. Uh, we do quite, we do echo quite frequently, and we try to monitor these patients uh, in in the correct fashion. And uh, and basically, that, that that's it. Then one question is for Matilda: uh, Would the stroke management will be different than the normal stroke in COVID nineteen patient? And what are the recovery phase? Is it the same as the normal stroke, or you know, it is uh, different and uh, much prolonged? No, the, the in the stroke unit in the in the neuro covid department here well, had by professor alessandro padovani they had some stroke but they were stroke in which the coronavirus positivity was discovered after so the first was the treatment of stroke without uh, thinking of the coronavirus so far so good the the procedures are kept the same only that the kind of procedures and protection that you have to provide to the Uh, health personnel required a complete separation into the neurological department of stroke covid and stroke non covid and the majority of symptoms were related to stroke so the kind of symptoms related to the pulmonary involvement were lower so it was treated like a normal stroke patient plus he was provided with the plaquenil and the uh, antibiotics so, so but the main focus was uh, dealing with stroke so stroke therapy but we had another problem here is that many patients in uh, italy as you know uh, what you need to do in the stroke unit intervention within the first three hours uh, most of patients they are so worried to come to the hospital because they're worried to have covid that we had some problems in delaying presentation to the stroke unit because of people afraid to come to the hospital and this delay is worsening the clinical outcome of stroke patients so it's not different the treatment of stroke the problem is that patients tended during the peak now the also frank was showing we are seeing that patients tend to come back a bit now that we are after one month but at the very first two three weeks people people were not coming to the hospital So we were missing the, the, the window of three hours in which you can really, so the stroke that came are, have a worst outcome, but also because they came later. So that is something that we cannot tell to people to change, but this is what happened. So you mean to say if there is even a COVID positive and if he comes in three hours, he must be thrombolyzed. It, it has to be treated also because you don't have the time to do the test. Within the three, you treat the stroke. You treat what is worst gets treated first. That's the rule of any ER. So okay. you treat the stroke, but and that is another rule that we learn here. You treat everything as if it is dirty. So you start the assumption that no patient is clean. Potentially, everybody that presents into the hospital these days could be positive. So then health professional have to treat themselves as if the patient is positive. You have put the glasses, you put the uh, shoes and the gloves and the mask, everything, and you treat the stroke. Maybe then the patient is COVID negative, fine, you've been wasting some uh, protection material, but if it is not negative, then uh, you have been able to protect yourself and not to get into some operation that are going to put you at risk. 
So Matilda, our great friend Thomas Plaats has asked you one question. Yeah. He says usually with post uh, intensive care syndrome, we have the motor, cognitive, and emotional disturbances as a consequences of multi organ dysfunction failure. Do you see the cognition and emotional disorder as frequently in COVID nineteen picture cases? And thanks uh, for your good talk. Okay, first of all, we still have more than 750 patients still in the intensive care unit, which is sort of a high number out of the 2,500. The 500 that recovered, some of them needed like a um, hospitalization in rehabilitation, real hospitalization in rehabilitation centers. So their syndrome there has been allotted. I just wanted to underline that in the rehabilitation units, we are now seeing some embolic uh, in thromboembolic uh, uh, patients that were not expected because we were thinking that everything was finished when they were hospitalized. And we had to work because, you know, the attention was trying to go down, okay? They are out of the ICU. So there was not that kind of attention that usually rehabilitation is putting after an intensive care unit because there were so many patients and all the rehabilitation were filled. The problem we had with rehabilitation outside the hospital is that 50 per, more than 50% of personnel got infected. So in one week, all these rehabilitation units lost 50% of personnel, while the number of people needing rehabilitation was tripling and doubling, and there was no personnel to replace the, the, the sick one. And that created a lot of problems. Usually nurses are one nurse in rehabilitation for 10 beds. And we had to think here, one nurse for 15 beds and everything went balloon. We had to rearrange the organization, not only of the hospital, but also of the rehabilitation unit. And I really warn, this is why I've been saying from the beginning, the most important information here is take care of the rehabilitation. Because if all your personnel is sick, you are missing an important flow of patients. Because uh, the, the more the ICU becomes able to contain the respiratory symptoms, the more patients should be quickly discharged out of the hospital, possibly go back home. We were planning three weeks ago that many patients were going back home. Unfortunately, because of this chronic illness myopathy, many patients cannot go home. Also because they're old and many people, we have this problem in Italy. I don't know how it is in India. Maybe you still have the big, big families, but in the North, many old people are alone. So you cannot send them back home because they have nobody to take care of them. And also this is a social issue that is entering into this managing of the disease. Thank you, Matilda. We have uh, many, many questions about AT, and I don't think we have time to reply all of them. So we'll certainly uh, uh, send you the email of questions and you could uh, answer them and we will post it on the uh, website along with the, uh, this thing, uh, our whole presentation. The last question for you, Frank, is, is there, have you seen a relapse? And uh, what are your protocol for the testing you were testing? only the contact or the general test? Mm -hmm. Question. Only contact or general test. Uh, regarding the uh, first question, we haven't seen any relapse unless it's because, uh, uh, hello, can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, regarding the relapse, we, we, we haven't seen any uh, relapses yet, uh, but we have seen people coming back, for example, they have been released from the ICU to the ward, and sometimes a few patients have uh, a required uh, readmission to the ICU. Mostly, as uh, as was mentioned, these patients do have, we noticed this right away, an important uh, muscle weakness. Uh, the idea is that even more than the usual uh, ARDS patient. So this is important both in the initial phase where you have a patient breathing non-invasively, you can't keep this patient on uh, non-invasive ventilation too long, either because you're creating uh, possibly volatrauma and self-inflicted lung injury, and because the patient is becoming weaker and weaker and will require um, invasive ventilation. And we've seen that when the patient, uh, we're going towards weaning, we're trying to wean the patient from the ventilator, despite having good blood gas uh, analysis, a good PF ratio, um, tidal volumes or whatnot, 
the patient still has a lot of difficulty uh, weaning from the ventilator because of the, uh, the chronic, uh, uh, because of, sorry, the uh, polyneuro uh, muscular, myo poly, <laughs> creamy name we call it, uh, myopathy and neuropathy, which has developed. So that's an important issue. So the patients we've seen come back are mostly due to patients who required um, continuous help because of that. Also, just to add a further note, re re uh, regarding the sedation, now we haven't, I haven't personally seen any um, increase in the cognitive impairment of these patients. Unfortunately, when these patients do worsen, they worsen and they're quite awake when they do get, uh, uh, when they do gradually start to deteriorate. Um, so they know exactly what's going on until they get, they get, uh, they, they receive the necessity to be intubated. Now, uh, in the post, uh, ICU phase, there have been some cases of, uh, delirium, but again, you have to, what the, a lot of these patients requiring, of, uh, protective ventilation, uh, they do require heavy sedation and, uh, curarization, muscle relaxant. And this is definitely associated with uh, the incidence of delirium. So be careful on how much you sedate these patients. If possible, I do suggest uh, monitoring the sedation. There are many ways of monitoring sedation. You can monitor the depth of sedation, and that's very important because these patients eventually have to be weaned and they have to be brought back home. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say is because of telemedicine, Telemedicine is important, a way of uh, avoiding the, the need for the elderly to have to physically use the uh, uh, tablet or IC phones is there are some devices out on the market where you can actually apply them to the patient. Uh, it's a wristband and uh, they would measure the, ne the necessary parameters which are automatically conveyed to the doctor uh, through uh, telemedicine on his uh, uh, smartphone or, or whatnot. So that could be uh, a uh, alternative. The other question was, sorry. I think we need to now close the session. Okay, okay. We okay. got another session at two o'clock. So what I will do is uh, I will send you all the questions. You could uh, record and send it and we will yeah. play them. Pramod, uh, you can take over to close the session, please. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Frank and uh, Dr. Matilda for joining here. And we uh, definitely learned a lot from your firsthand experience of COVID. And hopefully that we will apply the same guidelines in India and hope that uh, we can go forward with your advice and your experience. Thank you very much. I thank. Thank all you. People. Good luck to thank everybody. You. Hope to see you soon without you. virus. Thank Bye. You. Thank, you. So, Bye -bye. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Nirmal.